All right, so welcome back to class again. I'm kind of excited, scared, and a little crazy today because, well, I decided to change the slides um, completely. <laughs> and this is still in progress, so I haven't finished, right? So and you're going to get an almost ready lesson today. Um, what happens is that this semester we taught EBMs uh, in the third a uh, couple of weeks, right? So we had first couple of weeks, uh, inference and training of networks. Second week, we had parameter sharing. So uh, recurrent network and convolutional network. And then the third couple of weeks, we talk about energy-based model, which Jan likes a lot. And usually no one understands uh, anything because we usually teach this later in the semester when you uh, are busy with projects, already done the homework. So, you know, it's hard to pay attention to this complex weird things this semester we decided to change completely the order and we taught ebms last week and the week before right so now i'm supposed to teach topics that i used to teach before ebms with the knowledge that you actually have now about ebms and so i'm like uh oh <laughs> Your perspective now is different from the perspective of students from last semester because you have a different baggage, bag of knowledge. And so everything I would have said last semester doesn't apply this semester. And then I had to change my slide, but it was so a pain because I had to redraw everything and I didn't finish, of course, but I tried my best. OK, so here we go. Uh, not all animation will work. I fix this in, in the editing of the video. So whenever the, the video was, will be up, everything will be just wonderful, but you get some almost version, okay version, okay? And so, um, wish me luck. <laughs> so what do we talk about today? Uh, cool things. So, okay. Let me actually start with today's lesson title. All right, so generative models, right? Today I wanted to talk about generative models. Uh, I usually spend quite a lot on the uh, motivation. I will try to spend less time and actually share later uh, latest results uh, that came out like um, th this year, actually. Uh, so it's actually a very up-to-date lesson, okay? So usually I start my lesson on this uh, topic about with these two pictures. My question is, which of the two images is the real one? If you think the real image is the one of the lady, click the green button. If you think the uh, real image is the one of the dude, click the red button. So I can see what you think. Green, lady, red, the dude. Most of you say that the lady is real, the dude is not. And you can clearly tell that uh, that you are right in the sense, I mean, the, the, the dude is not real because the background is completely uh, funky, right? So the background has this kind of, you know, artifacts you can notice here uh, that are clearly uh, generated by a network. On the other case, both images actually are, you know, fake. And you can find more pictures on uh, www, this person does not exist, something like that, right? So you can, you can go online later and check these images. Uh, and these are images generated by a neural network, okay? So this is kind of mind-blowing. It was mind-blowing when it came out. Now it seems reasonable or even uh, trivial, but it is not been the case for a long time we were not able to generate images okay so we are talking about today generative models so what are generative models models that generate data that lives in this kind of input space right in the space of images for example or the the type of domain that we are used to process with neural nets okay so you can lower your your sign so that there is no leftover here on the chat Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. So we are going to be learning in the next three lessons, basically how we can generate similar images or even better. Okay. Um, once again, these images really look photorealistic because they observe many different variations of, you know, faces in this case. 
but on the other side, it has been, you know, the things that have been changing over time has been the background, right? So the background is less defined because it has not really seen a systematic, uh, you know, a, what was the word? Stationary type of background. Now, faces are the kind of element that are recurring. The background are more uh, varied. So there's no, you know, uh, they didn't catch on those statistics of the, you know, background. All right, cool. So that was the first, you know, initial part of this talk. Usually it's, again, it used to be surprising. Uh, next one. Oh yeah, this is from Karas, right? 2019. All right, so one more thing. Whenever you, we used to do interpolation in computer vision, it means, you know, having part of one image and part of the other image, right? And so and then you try to, you do a linear interpolation. So what happens, what's gonna happen now if I do a linear interpolation of these two images? How am I gonna be filling up those, you know, uh, missing squares here, the, the space? Anyone can guess what, what is the outcome if I do a linear interpolation of these two images? Are you, if you have some familiarity with computer vision, can you guess? in the chat blurred I, I would not say blurred they you wouldn't have a blur result uh, it's a different word maybe blurry was you maybe you think about something else the the word blur is not correct though uh any any other suggestion just layering the two images yes and average pixel hold on so layering the two image means what does it mean so you're going to have basically some sort of translucent effect. Okay. So if I do a hundred percent dog, doggy, and then 0% bird, you're going to have, you know, hundred percent dog. Then if I do 10% dog and then oh, someone rose a hand, what happened? I don't know. Uh, if you have 10% dog and then 90% uh, the, the bird, you have like some sort of translucent thing, right? So if I show you here, you're going to get something like that, right? So, this is what exactly means doing a linear interpolation in pixel space. But if I would think, if I would ask, you know, can you come up with like a chimera, which is like, you know, half dog, half bird, you wouldn't be, you know, necessarily thinking about, you know, something that looks like this thing over here, right? So where is my laser pointer, laser pointer? So this thing over here doesn't look like a chimera. This looks like an artifact, right? I mean, this is not what we think when we interpolate in our brain. Why is that? Because in our brain, in our mind, we interpolate the concept, right? I think about the bird, I think about the, the dog, and then I, boom, combine them and I want to see a doggy bird or birdy dog. Um, so can we do, what, what can we do? So if we do an interpolation instead of the pixel space, we do it in the hidden representation of the network, and then I decode that interpolation, then I may get something that looks like this. So you're gonna get like a dog, a lesser of a dog, a, you know, a birdie dog, a halfway through, and then you start to see a doggy bird and more or less some weird stuff. And then there's a chicken. And then finally you get our bird. Okay. And so this is also, you know, there, there used to be surprising results. You now this was mind blowing how you actually managed to create a chimera and you, you get this kind of, you know, uh, weird stuff, uh, about chimeras. No, if you, if you, I, I always, you know, re remind you that in the, uh, Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, there was a very nice episode, I believe, uh, where, you know, there was like a, a chimera being made with a dog. Uh, very disturbing uh, anime, <laughs> but I loved it. Anyway, moving on. Um, so these are, you know, part of the what can be done in terms of generative models. I'm going to show you very soon what a ex undergraduate from NYU has done uh, last month, I think. It's incredible work. Uh, anyway, so moreover, you can also have, you know, some semantic uh, changes or actually some specific, you know, variations of your produced images, right? 
So in this case, we move, you know, have all the possible interpolation between like a manta, I believe on the left hand side and a dog on the right hand side. And in the between, it actually looks like a, a polypus. Then it looks like a monkey. So it's absolutely mesmerizing, I believe, how this, you know, interpolation from manta to dog actually goes through po polyp, not polypus. How do you call it in English? This octopus, right? And polypus is in Italian. <laughs> Sorry. So you, you go from the manta to the octopus and down to the dog. Okay. Uh, again, lovely. Or you go from this furry uh, doggy on the left hand side to some sort of um, squirrel and back to a bird. Okay. Uh, or you go from the skunk, I believe it's called, to a raccoon <laughs> to a dog. I don't know what breed is that. Or this one, you convert a bird into a fly. Okay, again, this stuff is, uh, to me, mind-blowing. Or in this case, you actually uh, condition... <laughs> okay, so this is actually a first word I'm using today. Uh, we have a conditional generative model in this case, okay? And you condition the generation of this image, of this thing, on this conditional variable, which is telling you what to change in what direction. Okay. Uh, we just, we just, we don't just generate stuff. It's not just a generative model. It's a conditional generative model. Right? You condition on specific, uh, you know, transformations. Anyway, so you have a zooming of the dog. You have like some shifting of a daisy. You have some also shifting in the other direction of a lemon, I believe. Or you can change the brightness of an image and pay attention here. The brightness is not the brightness in terms of, you know, luminance, uh, computer vision brightness. It's the brightness in the part of the day this stuff was uh, recorded, right? Because the model has understanding of how these specific, you know, first row, uh, these kind of images look across the whole day, right? Uh, in the morning, at, 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 at noon in the evening at you know mid midnight and so on right and so whenever you change the brightness actually you are changing the time of the day in which you are going to be generating this output right again to me i'm like then i don't know if you also are but okay maybe you do modern major okay but you can do oh you know you can react to my idiotic things but okay if you like all right cool nice um on the second case you have a 2d rotation so you're actually panning around right and in the and the other one instead is a 3d rotation so you're actually going around right so the, the second one you actually look around and in the other one you actually go around right uh and which is like I also believe it's crazy in the sense that the network is able to map on a 2D grid, right? That is these uh, signals that we've been talking about, a internal, possibly a possibly internal 3D representation of the reality, right? So the, the, the model learns how to do a 2D projection of this internal 3D representation, which is again, mind blowing, but again, I, maybe I'm, I'm easily, uh, <laughs> Mind blown. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, this was also, this is actually also not trivial. So we, we've been talking about mostly supervised learning, perhaps where you have a sample X, uh, and then you have a Y, which is like a target and you try to predict the target from the X, right? So you have an X would be different type of images. You try to predict in which bin they should belong, right? So you always, we've been always working maybe with uh, vector to vector mapping. In this case here, we are going to basically generate a anime representation given the photograph of a person. We don't have labels. <laughs> I mean, unless you get an artist doing the drawings of these people, it, it, we, we don't have X and Ys, right? We, we only have examples of photos of ladies, in this case, examples of drawings of uh, ladies, uh, anime, female anime, 
but we don't have the correspondence. Nevertheless, this model learns somehow, you know, we don't know yet how, how to make the connection between the two different styles while preserving the uh, content, right? The semantic content. So we preserve the content, the, the actual, you know, subject while changing the style with which it's represented. So it's like a translation, right? You have a language in input, like a natural language or whatever, realism photographs, and it gets converted into still like same type of signal, like a, a image, right? But on a different type of language, right? And so maybe this is different from what we have seen before, right? Before we were going from one domain, like signals to labels or targets or whatever. Right now we are going from signals to signals. So we stay within the same type of domain, okay? So whenever we generate stuff in, the, in this kind of, you know, uh, input domain, let's call it this way, then this stuff is called, these models are called generative models because they generate stuff in this input domain, which I'm not going to be calling X because uh, we figure very soon what is X, what is Y, and what is Z, okay? We are going to be having some definitions. Hopefully, I didn't mess them up, okay? All right. Uh, two more examples, then we actually start with a lesson. Uh, super resolution, okay? So this is like a, actually, um, how do you call it? In stylistic, no, like a, a pictogram, right? A, like a representation of what it means. But uh, what it does is basically you input a pixelated uh, image, and then you try to restore what is the high frequency content of that image. Uh, like you, you fill in the details, basically. Okay? So you provide this pixel whale, no dolphin, I think is a dolphin. <laughs> and then you get out this one. Okay. But this again, this is just a pictorial representation of what this stuff does. Uh, the example I'm going to show you now is going to be something from 2009, like, you know, eons ago. So it's not even using deep learning, but that's the introduction to this specific subject. Uh, on the left hand side, you provide some very uh, low resolution kind of image here has been up sample with a nearest neighborhood uh, algorithm. And then the outcome, what we expect the, the model or whatever uh, to produce is going to be this very nice refined version. Okay. Uh, it's rather simple because there are only, you know, straight lines or curved lines, but it's like black and white. There is no much uh, crazy things going on. On the right hand side, you can see how the zebra here got its bands or stripes very well reconstructed and now they look very neat and nice, right? So this looks like someone fixed the, uh, you know, lower resolution input. How do we do this? Oh, there are questions here. Uh, we give the low leftmost and the rightmost images to the model, right? Yeah, yeah. So the, in the case of the anime, we provide both distributions and somehow uh, the model will learn both and then we have to learn somehow how to associate one with the other, right? But again, we are gonna be talking about this in a couple of lessons from now. I'm just giving you some, you know, cookies, no cookies, like, you know, uh, candies, eye candies, right? Uh, so you get hungry and you're ready to learn and, and absorb what I'm going to be teaching you soon. Hopefully, if he actually <laughs> runs and works again, animation will be broken. In this case, you, yeah, the question was like, how do we manage to reconstruct and fill in the missing information? So in this case, you can see that uh, this is the down sample version of the image or our input. Uh, here, there is a up sample version with a, uh, uh, bilinear interpolation. Uh, this was the up sample version using the uh, nearest neighborhood. This is the original image. And here you have actually the reconstructed image. Okay. Oh, the other way around. Sorry. This is the original image. See, I cannot even tell them apart. Uh, this is the original image and this is the reconstructed image. They changed the eye color. So the, on the left hand side, I see blue or green eyes. On the right side, I see brown or black eyes. And also the, the, the skin, skin tone is different. Uh, 
perhaps it was on a shade and then the, in the model thought it was a darker type of skin, whereas there was perhaps just a, a sh shadow. Uh, what you notice here uh, is that, you know, whenever I provide this image over here, the third row to my model, given that this model has been observing mostly uh, white dude faces, the Asian dude, actually, you know, instead of being Asian, became a European. Okay, and so this happens because of bias in the data set, right? Uh, the model knows and has been trained on a subset of all possible faces. When asked to reconstruct the, uh, you need to do to fill in the gaps, it's going to fill in the gaps with the best of the knowledge it has uh, acquired from the, the training data set. Okay, uh, similarly. Uh, <laughs> This lady, which has a side view, and there were not many side views in the data set, doesn't quite get reconstructed appropriately, no? And it seems that, you know, it's, you know, not proper, appropriately reconstructed, let's say. Or some, similarly, uh, since I believe this data set didn't contain many examples of um, faces with glasses, so in this, like in this case, uh, you can see that the reconstructions looks like, you know, he had an, a car accident or something like that. Um, and the last one was also uh, perhaps interesting how in, I believe the model may have changed the sex of this, uh, of this last reconstruction, right? So it was a lady and it actually become, it looks to me, uh, a dude. Uh, again, these are just based on what the model uh, training distribution was, right? And then the model just fill in the gaps at, uh, at the best of its capabilities. Uh, some more uh, here is called in painting. In this case, in in painting, we basically remove a portion of my of the image, and then we task the model to reconstruct or to fill in the gaps. Okay. So these are other, you know, possible uh, applications of generative models. Let's say uh, you have like um, you 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 shooting a movie and there are you know some people walking in the, in the background. Uh, you can simply you know select the, the people and then ask your model to fill in the gaps at the best of its uh, capabilities, and it's going to be basically making those you know cuts disappear. Or like in this case, we have like a rectangle, uh, a gray rectangle over the mouth. And then we ask the model to, you know, uh, fill in this region with the best of uh, its capabilities. And that this is the outcome. Uh, again, these are very old results. These are from uh, five, uh, five years ago, four years ago. Uh, and it used to be the case that VAEs were performing performing uh, slightly worse than uh, generative adversarial networks. Uh, I think now we can say they caught up, uh, especially with the discrete version of the variational autoencoder. We're going to be talking about these two architectures in the next and the next next lessons. So again, this is not you're not supposed to know these things. I'm just telling you that. Uh, this is when we saw the first actually results working pretty decently, which is again, what is, it was 2017, perhaps. All right, cool. Ha, okay. So, and, and here we go back to uh, advertising, maybe. I don't know if it's advertising. So I'm going to be talking about right now very quickly about the last type of uh, generative example, which is going to be caption to image, okay? Uh, these are results from this year, 2021, right again, uh, I made this stuff yesterday night, like the, the, the slides. And these are from Aditya Ramesh. Aditya was a, a undergraduate student here at NYU when I joined as a postdoc with Jan. And Aditya knew more than I did when I had a PhD and he had uh, under, he didn't even finish his undergraduate at that time, right? He finished afterwards, like uh, after I think a semester uh, from when I, when we met. Uh, and you can tell how far he went, right? He works, he's a, a scientist now at OpenAI. Um, again, to me, this is mind blowing. Let me show you. In this case, uh, the model is provided with a sentence description, okay? An armchair in the shape of an avocado. And then uh, it's duplicated basically, an armchair imitating an avocado. And this is what the model generates, okay? The model generates a armchair in the shape of an avocado. I'm like, 
what? <laughs> what is this magic? This is crazy. All right. Uh, then I change a word, right? Instead of saying in a shape, I say, uh, well, I say a clock in the shape of an avocado, right? So this was an armchair. Now I changed to a clock in the shape of an avocado. And now you, you, you've got these other images, right? But instead of a shape, let's say, uh, well, again, I changed uh, into a lamp, a lamp in a shape of an avocado. And this is switching, right? So we had a clock, we have an armchair, clock, armchair, and now I changed to a lamp in the form of an avocado. So this is the form. Whereas this was the shape, I don't know what's the difference. I guess semantics, I don't know English enough to tell the difference. But then how about I change the, the, the avocado, right? So let's, instead of having avocado, let's use a pig. Oh, oh my God, this is a lamp in the form of a pig or a lamp in the form of a lot, lotus root. This is again, mind blowing, right? Um, and you can also see this stuff by yourself on the website. Uh, Dali. Yeah. You're still with me, right? Yes. Okay. So in this case, this is also crazy here. So you have an illustration of a baby. Okay. Let me zoom a little because I cannot see. So an illustration of a baby daikon radish in a tutu walking a dog. Okay. So this is things generated by a network. Instead of a baby daikon, let's have a baby panda. Oh, <laughs> this is so cute. Or a baby penguin. <laughs> I mean, seriously, in a tutu? No, let's say in a pyjama. No, a wizard, wizard hat. Oh, or with sunglasses. Okay. This is Walking a dog. No, let's change. Watching TV. Okay. Again, this looks like science fiction to me. Uh, this is crazy. How is this done? Relatively easy. Can I explain it to you? Not yet. You have to wait until two lessons from today. Three. Will I explain this to you? Yes. Will you, will you understand? Yes. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> It's not that difficult once we have all the building blocks. Okay. I just hope you, uh, is the text prompt over a limited set? No, it's just a, a sentence up to 256, uh, words, I, I believe. Okay. So you can just ask whatever you want and this model will generate things. Okay. These are PN, uh, pixel, pixel space. Okay. So these are images, 256 times 256 images. Okay, so you should be hungry, crazy, and you know, uh, I mean, I'm crazy, but we, we knew we knew that already, but you should be at least, I hope, excited to understand and be, you know, attentive for the next three lessons to figure out how this is even, you know, possible, okay? And again, it's gonna be, we build this step by step. Hopefully I make slides on time. <laughs> Okay. All right. So let's move on and we start with today lesson. Definitions. Okay. Why do we have definitions? Because otherwise we don't make sense. Okay. So what are X? What is Y? What is Z? Okay. So X is observed during training and testing. Okay. So X is always there. When you do classification, X is going to be your image. Is going to be there doing every time, right? What is why? Why is going to be observed only during training. We try to predict why during testing. Okay. So why is only ob uh, observed uh, to you yeah, during training. Supervised learning means there was a human gener generating annotations. So there has been a someone, a person creating these uh, pairs X and Y. Okay. Which are again, uh, human annotated during testing. We don't have why, no? for example, again, in the image classification, we don't have the labels at, you know, inference time. Uh, we just try to predict the label given that we have the X, the, the, yeah, the X Z instead is the latent variable, uh, is never observed. 
nor during training, nor during testing. We have no idea, but it's a input variable we have a control over. And then we may find by you know, minimizing the energy of the system. Okay? And so let, let's get a recap about how we were playing with this X, Y, and Z last lesson, last, last week, okay? Okay, X doesn't have to be an image or Y doesn't have to be a label, right? In the case that I just showed you right now, my X is the string of text, okay? In this last case, no, in the, in the Lotus root thingy here, right? So in this case, my X is gonna be the text prompt, a lamp, a lamp in the form of a lotus root, a lamp imitating a lotus root. This is my X, which is a set, or I would actually say it's a sequence in this case, right? Because it's a sequence of possible tokens, right? That is, you know, making up this text. So it's a sequence, my X. So we talk about sequences a few lessons ago, right? So you have curly brackets, then we had uh, X, uh, um, X, square bracket t i think actually yeah we have x square bracket t uh and then we had basically we were talking about the recurrent network right so in this case my x is a, a sequence of tokens discrete tokens um in my y in this case my y is an image okay it's not a target it's not a label well it's just my y okay perhaps yeah we can call it target in this case actually uh, so last time we talked about this one here no it's gray out because we already talked about this was uh how we were generating that uh horn looking like thingy you know given that we had a given x so moving x we were moving across this uh you know horn and then given the, the latent variable, the input, my latent missing input, we can generate all possible points around this, you know, possible uh, ellipses. Yes, my screen is dim because we already observed this one. Uh, and so we, here we had all these uh, X, Y, and Z, right? So X, in this case, this was a conditional uh, EBM, latent variable model, right? And then we talk about this other one. Uh, in this case here, we also saw that this was the unconditional case, right? We didn't have X. Y is still our target, right? But we don't long, no, we no longer condition on X. Or in this case, X was one, uh, chosen one, okay? So in this case, I was, I, f I set X to be zero, so we don't change it. And we just try to model the Y distribution, okay? But that was, yeah, pretty much it. So, how do we how did we train uh, that model, right? So I'm just going back in the unconditional case. So unconditional case means there is no X, okay? We don't have any thing during evaluation. We only have our Ys. We, the Y, we use them during training, right? We said, but then during evaluation, we don't have anything and we don't have axes, right? So that's why here we don't have axes. And so how do we, how do we train this model, right? So to train this model, we take an observation, Y, okay? We were computing the free energy, basically trying to get the, find out the Z, which is giving us the Y tilde, it is the closest to, uh, to my Y. And then given that we have found this free energy, which was the mean or soft mean of the E, then we were minimizing uh, that loss functional, such that that uh, energy, free energy was low for my observed sample, okay? And we know, we repeat this so many times, an energy is well behaved when it is low on good samples and is high otherwise, you know? And there are two ways to do that. One is the contrastive method, which is, you know, pushing down the energy on my good uh, samples and pushing up the energy on the bad samples, that, it, that is the contrastive. Or in the case we, we covered in class last week, uh, we had like an architectural case where we chose Z to be only one dimensional. So it can only uh, vary on one dimension while the Y covers two dimensions, right? Uh, and so, in this case, we limited the amount of uh, regions that the energy can have, you know, lower 
can be low, right? Because it's just on, on a line. We, we curve the line, but it's still, still on a line, right? And so this was how we were training an energy-based model. I think, I hope you remember, okay? Now it's no longer dim the screen because this is, you know, just training recap. We didn't see this slide before. So we start now talking about something called, let's see. So this one is the diagram we know, right? So far, it should be okay. Let me actually remove those things. So this model has only a decoder, okay? This model doesn't have a, a forward path, right? So there is no input. There is no, well, the energy-based model has an input, which is the Y, but there is, in the classical sense, no, there is no X provided to you. We only have the Ys, only the targets, okay? Try not to get confused on, about this. So what happens to this Y? So first thing, we had this H here appearing, and then basically we have to compute H through a mechanism. Before we were finding Z, how did we find the optimal Z? The optimal Z, the Z check, was the Z that was minimizing me the energy, okay? The E. So we, have, we were getting Z check by minimization of the E. And then we were, you know, training by minimizing that free energy. In this case, we're going to be using an encoder over here to come up with my intermediate code H, okay? My hidden code. And so in this case, we use this encoder over here to perform something called amortized inference, okay? That, thank you, Arthur. So here, instead of computing the minimization of the energy E uh, with respect to Z, we actually have an encoder which is approximating this minimization and is providing me an H, a hidden representation, given my Y, okay? So I have my Y, I encode the Y. And this is the first time we see an encoder, right? So before, when we saw this other diagram, we had a predictor, right? So from X, we predict a hidden representation, which got decoded into the Y tilde. In this case, there is no predictor. In this case, there is an encoder because we already have Y. So we encode Y into my H, my hidden representation, and then we decode a a H into back to the Y tilde. Okay, I hope it's clear. So my equations are, kind of the same, so it's not a big deal. So we have that the hidden representation is going to be my uh, squashing function of the rotation of my input, the, the y, right? So the y is the observation. Then I have that my y tilde is going to be another squashing function g of the rotation of my hidden representation. In this case, y and y tilde, they both belong to this Rn, this you know, input type of space. And then the H is going to be my uh, living in RD, which is this internal representation. Again, WH and WY are going to be the matrices for rotating this stuff. So no big deal. Okay. All right. So this was the autoencoder. The big deal is that we have a module now, this encoder, which is performing this amortized inference. And we no longer have to minimize this E energy. Actually, if you can see now, there is a F here. Right? All right. Cool. I hope it's fine. So here there are uh, two examples of reconstructions energies, right? The first one is going to be simply the uh, square Euclidean distance between my observation and my, you know, guess, my Y tilde. And what is this Y tilde? Y tilde is the decoded version of the encoded version of Y, right? So encoded Y is H, then I decode the H, I should get Y tilde. Then I compute the difference y minus y tilde, and I take the square norm. Uh, if I have binary input, then I simply compute, for example, this uh, binary cross entropy between each element of this uh, target, uh, well, this y and the y tilde. Okay. How do we train this stuff? Well, still same way. So we have a loss functional, which is, for example, this average across all training samples of this per sample loss functional, and then 
I could simply take the energy loss. No, I tried to push down the energy on these white. So question for people at home. What is the uh, objective of an autoencoder? Okay, let me actually go back here. You should be able to answer this question before I tell you uh, why, what, right? Why do we want to have an autoencoder, no? What is the reason that someone would want to use an autoencoder? Can you guess? Okay, so people here on the, in, in a, on the chat are suggesting dimensionality re uh, reduction. Uh, dimensionality reduction could be possibly one application, but that's definitely not what we are interested in here. Uh, I'm gonna go, uh, I'm gonna be talking about that soon, but again, it's very, this is what I used to be thinking whenever I think about autoencoders, dimension, dimensionality reduction. But again, uh, we don't actually care about autoencoders for that a specific reason. Let me see another answer here. Okay, many answer. Let me enlar enlarge this thing. Uh, so get a lower dimensional representation. No. So yeah, I mean, I understand what you said. That is dimensionality reduction. Uh, but no, I mean, yes, you can, but that's maybe just one application. I, I, you are correct, definitely in saying that, but I'm, I'm actually going somewhere else right now with a reasoning process. Reconstruct why is what we do during training. Uh, learn the latent, I guess, hidden code. Uh, that is correct. Learn a lower dimensional representation, not necessarily. Uh, so we want to learn some code, right? Some, some, some representation. It doesn't have to be low dimensional. Actually, we may even want to have it high dimensional. What? <laughs> okay. Remove, remove noise. Yes. Uh, remove, remove noise is a good option. Okay. So forget about what you heard about autoencoders before. And now actually think about what you learned in last class with me and Jan, right? I mean, last two weeks. What are these energy based models? What are they supposed to do? How is F supposed to behave? Tell me. E, no, no, there is no more minimization here, right? Uh, we define that F is going to be, uh, I show you here, right? This stuff over here. But if you have a, an energy based model, right? Okay, there you go. Uh, Camila, hold on, hold on. Yeah, so I'm reading Camila's answer. So a good energy should be low <coughs> for good samples, high otherwise, okay? And so the reason that we want to learn an autoencoder, one of the reasons we want to learn autoencoder is to rank, let's say, if you want, it's not ranking, it's like to express how good a given Y is. And how do you do that? By learning what is the internal structure of the Y. And so what does an autoencoder do? An autoencoder learns the structure of your input, this, in this case, the Y, and encodes it in this H, hidden internal representation, which is a code that is expressing your input, <coughs> which doesn't, sorry, <coughs> which doesn't necessarily have to be smaller than the input. Then why on earth would we want to learn a larger representation than the input, right? This is getting crazy, I think. And so here we go. Under an overcomplete hidden layer. In the left-hand side is what you actually uh, correctly pointed out once a few minutes ago, that you know one possible application of autoencoders is to get a H representation of my Y, which is a smaller in terms of dimensions, and which is like performing basically dimensionality reduction by using some non-linear transformation. Uh, if you think about PCA, that's simply a linear uh, dimensionality reduction technique. This is a non-linear dimensionality reduction, which allows you to perhaps get a better representation. On the other case, 
I would argue, and that it's actually better to have a intermediate representation which is larger than the input. But now there is a problem, right? What is the problem? The problem is that how on earth am I supposed to be able to train this model and not have it collapse? So what is the collapse of an energy, energy based model? Tell me if I, I forgot, tell me what is, what, what is a collapse of an energy based model? Zero everywhere. Fantastic, right? So if you have a hidden representation that is larger than the input, the model could simply you know, transfer this value here, transfer this value here, transfer this value here. Then transfer this value here, transfer this value here, transfer this value here, and you have a perfect subtraction, zero. Every type of input gets zero perfect reconstruction. Hallelujah, awesome, fantastic. We have an autoencoder that is able to reconstruct everything. So my question now for you, which actually you can, you can actually answer, I believe. Yeah, what is an autoencoder that can reconstruct everything good for? Answer me. If an autoencoder can reconstruct every possible, yeah. If an autoencoder can reconstruct every possible input you present to it, what can you use this autoencoder for? Nothing, <laughs> right? If everything you provide, if you if you have an identity matrix, okay. So let's have an autoencoder which is an identity matrix. You provide a vector and the thing gives you back the same vector. Any vector you input, you get same vector output in output. Can you use the identity matrix to do anything? No, exactly. So an energy based model, which has collapsed, you know, it's flat or a autoencoder that can reconstruct everything, which is exactly the same is the same thing. I said, basically, you know, I just repeat myself are useless. Okay. A autoencoder is good only as long as it can reconstruct the samples that have been observed during training. Huh? Or in the other way, an energy based model is good only if it's not zero everywhere, <laughs> because otherwise it's like, you know, it's a flat, blah, what's called a flat, what's it called in English? The, 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 a plane, no, yeah, but uh, the one you are like, you are in the, like in, in Africa, what's called the, the flat, you have mountains and then you have the grassland pr prayer. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. It's no surface. Yeah, pr prayer, right? Val no valley. I guess grassland, right? It's like completely grass. You know, you can't tell anything, right? You want to have mountains. Otherwise it's boring. Okay. Is it possible to avoid collapse? Yes. Thank you uh, for asking. Yes, of course. So on the right hand side, how are we going to be using the right hand side technique, right? There are many ways you have to find a way to constrain the amount of regions that take zero or low energy value, right? That's what we've been learning so far. So we need to introduce some regularization, right? So we have regularized autoencoders. Uh, example of these are like sparsity. We can introduce a sparsity constraint over the hidden code, such that the hidden code has only a few units that are not zero. So zero, 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 poof, zero, zero, poof, poof, zero, 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 right? Uh, we may add additional noise. And we're going to be talking about that very soon. Uh, and then we may have like sampling that can also be used to, uh, you know, help us. All right. So in the next. Okay, I will be going. Oh, I cannot even go over time because I have another lesson going on. Oh my God. Okay, this is so bad. All right, what time is it? 10.24. <laughs> okay, so we're going to be talking now about the noise in autoencoder. This is my module I showed you before. I have my encode, decode, and the Y tilde. And then how does uh, the noise in autoencoder work? Well, I have, I take my Y, I corrupt my Y. And I have this Y hat in red. Okay. And I will, I want that, that Y hat has a high energy than this Y. Okay. So now we basically, a denoising autoencoder, it's a contrastive technique, basically. 
I, I create my bad samples. I take my good sample. Okay, there we go. So I have my good sample, the blue. I add some noise. Let's say I add some random Gaussian noise. I have, this is my, uh, this is my training manifold, the line. I have a few examples here showing in, a, in blue, with blue dots. Let's say I have my original Y in the center. I kick it out with some corruption. I'm gonna get my Y hat. How is supposed to be Y hat uh, energy with respect to Y? Larger, right? Y hat has the hat, means you push up the energy there. Um, how do we do that? Well, when we train this guy, we enforce that the output of the decoder, Y tilde, is going to be close to my original Y, regardless of the corruption. You see this, right? So my Y is my target. I corrupt my Y and I have this red high Y, which goes through this encoder decoder and the output it's still my original y okay i mean y tilde which is you know should be made close to be y right so i have my uh, my y blue y i displace this y over here but then i force my model to reconstruct it in the original location again i have my original y i pull it here and then i reconstruct it back there. I have my original Y, I pull it here, and I force the model to reconstruct it back here. So I'm going to be learning a vector field that is bringing me my displaced input back to the original location. Okay, we cover the notebook next time because it will be not possible otherwise to finish this explanation. So we said we were here, we had the training manifold, we had a few of these samples across this you know, thing. I have my original Y, I displace the Y, I get my Y hat, and then I enforce the denoising process, which is I enforce my Y tilde, which is the output of the system, to be attracted back to the Y. So I'm gonna show you this one, oh yeah. We assume that we are injecting the same type of noise we're going to be observing later on when we observe corrupted input. So in this case, I show you these points blue. I take these original points, I displace them, and I get this red perturb one. And then I enforce the system to go back to the original location. Now I take every possible point in this plane, I enforce the network, to put them back to the original location on this uh, spiral. So here I'm just showing you this quadratic distance, right? Between the reconstruction and my original points. So if the points actually are coming from this region, well, they didn't travel much after the reconstruction. Therefore, the energy term F is very low, close to zero. That's why it's purple. Instead, points that were far away here in the corner gets dragged down a lot. That's why the distance they travel is much larger. In this case, it's uh, one, right? And so here we have been learning an energy function by training a denoising autoencoder, which is basically getting these points that get displaced back in place, okay? As you can notice here, in the central region, Points were sometimes displaced towards this region, and then points were displaced during this region, right? Because this one was displaced up here and then put down here, but then also this point was displaced up here and then put down there, right? And so over there, you see like there is a region like flat on top, such that there are no gradients going in any direction. Otherwise, so it's, you have a mountain, but the top of the mountain actually it's, it's flat. I fixed that by actually now uh, enforcing the system to actually to be attracted by the closest point on the manifold. Okay, so from here, here I just take my original point, I displace the point, and I force the system to go back. I take the original point, I displace the point, I force the system to be, go back. I take the point, I displace the point, and I force the system to go back. In this other case, 
I take my point, I displace the point, I check which of the points is the closest one, and then I go back down. Then I take my point, I displace the point, I check which of the points is the closest to me, and then boom, I go there. Okay, so in this case, I try to fix that kind of flat top such that now it's like a crevice, I believe it's called in English, right? It has an edge rather than being flat. Okay. So it doesn't, no, it does not longer go back to the original location. Then I try to train this with uh, the sparse auto encoder. I was not able to succeed. You can see here are some, some purple regions across the manifold. That, is, that was the best I could have done. I couldn't get it to actually train properly. And I have to really stop here because I have another class starting uh, one minute ago. Uh, Thank you for being with us, with me. I will not be able to answer the questions. The notebook, I, I, I guess I will I, I try to cover the notebook next, I will cover the notebook next time. Uh, hopefully I get also the animation fixed such that the, the colors are gonna be the correct one, right? So my points are the blue points, right? They, they, are, they are blue and then the displaced one are red, they are hot, they have to have high energy, no? And then the output of the model is this kind of violet color. The slides will be uploaded in when I finish the second course. Thank you for being with me. Thank you for being patient, especially today with this, you know, new kind of lesson. I hope you were managed, you were able to follow. If you weren't able to follow, check the previous videos on energy based models, because again, we are building on top of what we've been covering. And so I, I, I felt uh, there was like the need for me to change the, the lesson based on your uh, current knowledge. And that was pretty much it. Again, peace, take care. Bye. I'm switching to the other course. <laughs> if you want to join, let me know. <laughs> Bye. Stop sharing.